SpaceX's Mars fuel plan requires 600 kilowatts of constant power. That's a solar farm larger than 13 football fields weighing 240 tons. Even Mars expert Dr. Robert Zubrin calls this approach fundamentally flawed. But here's what shocks scientists. His mini Starship solution could solve SpaceX's biggest logistical nightmare with just a fraction of the resources. Let's dive right in. When SpaceX engineers ran the numbers on refueling Starship on Mars, they uncovered a problem that left even veteran aerospace experts stunned. To manufacture 600 metric tons of methane and oxygen propellant in just 18 months, they'd need a constant 600 kilowatt power output, equivalent to running 400 American homes continuously, but on a planet where the nearest power grid is 140 million miles away. Here's the brutal reality. Meeting that demand with solar energy requires an array covering 60,000 square meters. Picture this. You'd need a solar farm larger than 13 football fields, weighing 240 metric tons, somehow transported and assembled on the most hostile construction site in the solar system. Just getting this infrastructure to Mars would consume at least three separate Starship launches before the actual mission even begins. And here's what few people realize about the engineering nightmare this creates. On Mars, dust storms can last for months, blocking sunlight and coating panels. Temperatures plummet to minus 80 degrees Celsius, making maintenance a life or death operation. Every component failure could strand your crew indefinitely, with the nearest replacement parts requiring a 26-month wait for the next launch window. But the problems run deeper than just power generation. Dr. Robert Zubrin, who's been studying Mars missions since before Musk entered the space game, identifies a fundamental flaw in SpaceX's approach. His analogy is devastating. SpaceX's plan resembles D-Day, attempting to drop massive numbers of settlers onto a hostile shore all at once. During the Normandy invasion, Allied forces could be continuously supplied from England via Liberty ships, carrying 10,000 tons each across a short channel in just hours. The contrast with Mars is stark. Each starship carries only 100 tons across a journey measured in months, not hours. Where D-Day succeeded through overwhelming logistics, Mars offers no such luxury. We'll come back to this critical point later. But first, there's something most mission planners completely overlook. The current SpaceX architecture requires launching seven full-size starships, one mission vehicle plus six tankers, within a single launch window to support just one flight. Miss that window due to weather, technical issues, or regulatory delays, and you're waiting another 26 months. The stakes couldn't be higher, and the margin for error couldn't be smaller. But this is just the beginning. What's really surprising is how one aerospace engineer's mini-solution completely transforms these impossible equations. Enter Robert Zubrin's Starboat, a concept so elegantly simple it makes you wonder why nobody thought of it sooner. By scaling down Starship's mass by a factor of five, this smaller vehicle doesn't just reduce complexity, it fundamentally rewrites the rules of Mars missions in ways that have aerospace insiders taking notes. Here's the breakthrough that changes everything. A starboat could return directly from Mars to Earth using just 120 tons of propellant, compared to the 600 tons required by full-size Starship. Even more remarkably, it could reach Mars orbit with only 50 tons of fuel, allowing a single orbital tanker to support up to five return flights. Think about what this means. Instead of betting everything on one massive mission, you get five chances to succeed. And here's what most people don't realize about the competitive advantage this creates. While SpaceX's current plan locks them into launching seven starships within a tight window, the starboat could be launched into Earth orbit fully fueled by a single starship and sent directly to Mars with five tons of cargo. No orbital refueling gymnastics, no complex coordination between multiple vehicles, no single point of catastrophic failure. But there's a detail most people overlook that makes this even more compelling. The starboat doesn't sacrifice crew capability, it optimizes it. NASA's traditional Mars concepts typically strand part of the crew in orbit aboard a mothership, where they're exposed to cosmic radiation and have little useful work to do. Zubrin's approach puts the entire crew of four to five on the surface where they're protected by Mars' natural atmosphere and can actively contribute to exploration. 
Now, here's where things get interesting from a strategic perspective. Mars has as much surface area as all of Earth's continents combined. Relying solely on slow-moving ground vehicles with limited range is like trying to explore North America with nothing but bicycles. The Starboat concept provides something no rover can deliver, global mobility across continental distances. With 50 to 100 tons of propellant, a Starboat could enable high-speed transport across Mars, opening up far more of the planet for exploration. Zubrin estimates that with just nine strategically placed refueling stations, the entire Martian surface could become accessible to human explorers. Suddenly, Mars exploration transforms from a localized camping trip to true planetary reconnaissance. The economic implications are staggering. Instead of SpaceX's all-or-nothing approach requiring massive infrastructure investments up front, the Starboat enables incremental progress with manageable risk levels. It's the difference between building the entire interstate highway system in one year versus developing it gradually as demand grows. And this leads to a remarkable discovery about why timing matters so critically in space exploration. The nuclear reality hiding behind these engineering choices reveals why Zubrin's critique cuts so deep. His analysis exposes an uncomfortable truth. Mars missions will almost certainly require compact nuclear reactors to generate reliable power. Solar arrays work on Earth, where we have repair crews, spare parts, and predictable weather. Mars offers none of these luxuries, but here's the catch that aerospace companies rarely discuss publicly. Nuclear reactors suitable for spaceflight require highly enriched uranium or plutonium, materials so tightly regulated that government involvement becomes not just likely, but absolutely essential. This isn't a technical hurdle. It's a fundamental shift in how Mars exploration must unfold. Why would SpaceX accept the enormous risks of their current massive approach when more practical alternatives exist? The answer reveals Musk's true ambition. He's not just planning to visit Mars. He's attempting to create a self-sustaining backup civilization for humanity. But as Zubrin emphasizes with devastating clarity, no Martian civilization could survive the complete collapse of Earth's civilization. High-tech societies depend on vast, complex divisions of labor that cannot be instantly replicated off-world. And here's what's truly noteworthy about the historical precedent. Cities of a million people only became common after the invention of long-distance transportation systems like railroads. On Mars, we're more likely to see networks of smaller settlements, each with populations from a few thousand to perhaps 50,000, similar to Renaissance Florence rather than modern New York. This is where the Starboat concept becomes revolutionary rather than just practical. Its global mobility capability could connect distributed Martian communities, enabling the resource sharing and specialization that any sustainable civilization requires. But there's something most planners completely miss about the timeline implications. What happens if we approach Mars colonization like the settlement of America? Small groups of pioneers first establishing farms and basic industries Laying groundwork for gradually larger waves of settlers? The Starboat approach aligns perfectly with this organic growth model, while SpaceX's current plan assumes we can skip straight to metropolitan-scale operations. The real question isn't whether we can get to Mars, but whether we can create something that survives and thrives once we arrive. And here's what's becoming increasingly clear from analyzing both approaches. The future likely combines SpaceX's ambitious vision with Zubrin's practical incrementalism in ways that neither camp fully appreciates yet. We're not going to Mars to abandon humanity. We're going to strengthen it by creating new, highly inventive branches of civilization. The choice between revolutionary leaps and evolutionary steps may be a false dilemma. The smartest path forward probably requires both strategies, executed with the kind of careful coordination that turns science fiction into historical fact. The race to Mars isn't just about rockets and fuel production anymore. It's about choosing the approach that gives human civilization the best chance to become truly multiplanetary. And that decision may determine whether our species thrives for centuries or remains forever vulnerable on a single world. This is exactly why Zubrin's mini solution represents more than just engineering efficiency. It's a fundamental shift in how we think about becoming a spacefaring civilization. While SpaceX dreams of million-person cities, 
The Starboat approach recognizes that sustainable expansion happens organically, one pioneer settlement at a time. What this means is we might not need to choose between Musk's ambitious vision and practical reality. The future of Mars exploration likely combines both approaches. Starboat missions establishing the foundation, while full-size starships scale up operations once infrastructure exists. It's not about abandoning the dream, it's about building a smarter path to achieve it. And this is just the beginning. NASA's Artemis program is already evaluating scaled propulsion systems, while private companies are racing to develop the nuclear power systems that both approaches will ultimately require. The next five years will determine whether we take incremental steps or revolutionary leaps toward Mars. How do you think this mini versus massive debate will reshape the timeline for human Mars missions? Will SpaceX adapt their approach or will other companies embrace the Starboat concept first? This is Space Corps, and we dive deep into the breakthroughs that are actually reshaping space exploration. If you want more analysis that cuts through the hype to reveal what's really happening, you know what to do. The path to Mars is being written right now, and it might look very different from what anyone expected. SpaceX just disabled one of Starship's three critical landing engines for Flight 10, and their engineers are stunned by the boldness. This isn't a malfunction, it's a calculated experiment that could make or break the future of Mars missions. Tai Sao SpaceX Lai Chapnhan, Rui Ro Naiki He, Tongba Jong Sho Jan Ho Jong Hua Hao, Chogi Jolon Hon Jang Dian Ra. This risky test reveals their secret strategy to unlock 200 ton payloads and true reusability. Let's dive right in. Here's the moment that left SpaceX's own engineering team questioning everything they thought they knew about rocket landings. SpaceX announced they're intentionally disabling one of Super Heavy's three critical center engines for Flight 10. Not because of a malfunction, not because of weight constraints, but because they want to deliberately create a failure scenario. And here's what few people realize. This decision came after heated internal debates. According to SpaceX's official update, one of the three center engines used for the final phase of landing will be intentionally disabled. When you understand that each of these engines generates approximately 500,000 pounds of thrust, the audacity becomes clear. They're removing 33% of their landing capability on purpose. Let me break down exactly what happens during this death-defying sequence. Super Heavy B-16, weighing roughly 200 tons empty, will scream back through Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. First, 13 engines fire simultaneously for initial deceleration. Imagine the controlled violence of 6.5 million pounds of thrust fighting against gravity and momentum. But here's where things get interesting. As the massive booster approaches the ocean surface, only two of the three center engines will ignite for the final landing burn. Think of it like a commercial airliner pilot deliberately shutting down an engine during landing approach, except this aircraft weighs as much as a fully loaded cruise ship and is moving at terminal velocity. The physics here are absolutely brutal. Those two remaining Raptor engines must generate enough thrust to both decelerate the entire booster and maintain pinpoint directional control. We're talking about precision measured in meters while managing forces that could crush a building. According to SpaceX, the booster will demonstrate a full hover state for several seconds, essentially floating a skyscraper-sized rocket on nothing but controlled explosions. But there's a detail most people overlook. This isn't just about proving redundancy. It's about unlocking fuel savings that could literally make or break Mars colonization. Every liter of propellant saved during landing burns translates directly to payload capacity. When you're targeting 200-ton payloads, enough to build entire Mars habitats in single launches, these efficiency gains become the difference between success and failure. We'll come back to this point later, but first consider this. The test builds directly on Flight 9's breakthrough with the active flip maneuver. Instead of letting the booster tumble randomly after stage separation, SpaceX now controls its orientation deliberately. This seemingly simple change saves massive amounts of fuel that would otherwise be wasted correcting the booster's trajectory. And here's what's truly mind-bending. 
SpaceX is also attempting a steeper re-entry angle than previous flights. Remember Flight 9's failure? The steep angle stressed the fuel transfer tube beyond limits, causing premature booster loss. Most companies would back away from such risks. SpaceX is doubling down, just with better engineering. As we'll see in the next section, this calculated risk-taking represents something much bigger than a single test. But this is just the beginning. What's really surprising is how this seemingly reckless experiment fits into a master plan that could reshape the entire space industry. To understand why SpaceX's engineers are truly shocked, you need to grasp what this test represents in the broader space industry picture. While Blue Origin is still struggling to reach orbit reliably, and ULA is just beginning to explore reusability concepts, SpaceX is optimizing fourth-generation landing systems with deliberately reduced capabilities. But the real story begins when you look at the numbers. Current space launch costs hover around $10,000 to $20,000 per kilogram to low Earth orbit. If Super Heavy achieves its target 200-plus ton payload with full reusability, costs could plummet below $100 per kilogram. That's not incremental improvement. That's economic disruption on the scale of the internet revolution. And here's what most analysts miss. This two-engine landing capability doesn't just provide redundancy. It enables entirely new mission profiles. Consider this scenario. A booster experiences engine failure during ascent, loses one center engine, but can still land safely using the remaining two. Instead of losing a $100-plus million vehicle, SpaceX maintains operational capability and turns around for another flight within weeks. Here's where things get interesting from a competitive standpoint. China's space program is advancing rapidly with their own reusable rocket concepts. Europe's space agency is developing competing technologies. But none of them are testing deliberate failure scenarios. They're still in the make it work perfectly phase while SpaceX is already in the make it work when things go wrong phase. This leads to a remarkable discovery. SpaceX isn't just building rockets. They're building aerospace philosophy. Traditional engineering prioritizes avoiding failure at all costs. SpaceX actively courts controlled failure to understand system limits. This approach has already proven transformational with Falcon 9, which has achieved over 